Um, at the end of the webinar, I will provide links for accessing the recording in the chat, so please stay tuned. To ensure a high quality recording, all attendees are encouraged to mute your mic. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box in the Zoom control panel and we will get to them um, during the discussion. So that's all from me. Without further ado, Jacques and Brysha, take it away. Thank you very much, Marissa. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. It's uh, lovely to see you all in the virtual space. We're going to kick off with introductions, and I'm going to uh, invite my esteemed colleague, Ms. Brysha Young. Would you come into the space and introduce yourself to our, to our guests this morning? Absolutely. Good morning, all, and happy Wednesday. Jacques, you know, I had to pause when I said that because I'm like, you know what? I never know what date it is, but I always know what day of the week it is. So exactly. Like, it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Um, I can't see all the smiling faces, but I, I feel the sentiment. I know someone's like, yep, yeah, I agree with her. I know what day it is. Now I certainly day. agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Bryce Young and a little bit about me. I have been in human resources for the past 15 years, uh, director level. I have had the pleasure of serving in the DEI space uh, for a decade now. Time flies when you are having fun and DEI is a load of fun growth challenges. And we'll talk about all of that today. I actually come from the private sector. So majority of my life experience is serving private sector uh, staff and employees through the powers of human resources, supply chains, transportation, um, as well as some local government. It has been a pleasure to be full time in the public space and being able to serve and honor uh, public sector and civil service workers. It's definitely been a unique experience, and I'm so happy that I've had the pleasure to be over here over the last two years and be doing this wonderful work with my colleague Jacques Whitfield. Um, a little fun fact about me is that me and my family own a nonprofit called Reach Out Mode and the deserving city of El Sobrante in the Contra Costa County area. So when I am thinking about sleeping, I am out serving the youth instead. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll rest one day, but today is not that day. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, back to you, Ja. Thank you, Brysha. Brysha also serves as the project manager for our DEI team. Our DEI team uh, is doing a lot of fabulous work, especially in the local government space, and we're going to share some of that uh, fabulosity with you. So a bit about myself. My name is Jacques Whitfield. I am the principal consultant at CPSHR, and I lead our DEI products and services team. Uh, we're so excited to be with you today. I've been in the human resources management space for 25 years, been doing diversity and inclusion inclusion work for that same period of time. Uh, now, most of my professional experience has been in the public sector, in the government sector. I've been with CPSHR for four lovely years. Prior to that, I served as a senior leader in the California Community College System, serving uh, for six years for the Yuba Community College District. So shout out to all the folks from Yuba City and Marysville. So glad that y'all could be on the call today. Prior to that, I served as a senior leader in the California K-12 system, serving as associate superintendent uh, of the Grant Union High School District here in Sacramento for almost 11 years. Going all the way back to the beginning, my first job ever was seventh grade math teacher. So uh, uh, education is a part of our DNA. We are excited to take you on this journey, uh, and, we're, and we're so grateful to be here. You know, Bryce, we've done a lot of work in the local government space. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, you know, because we have three principal areas of, of focus in our DEI practice, uh, state practice, education, and local governments. And so of our local governments, how, what would you opine is uh, are the number of engagements or percentages of our practice that's local government? Because I know it's been growing and I know you as the project manager um, have a lot of that, uh, have a lot of that awareness. I'm so glad you asked that, John. I was just crunching numbers for finance this morning. Uh, so 40% of our work right now uh, is local government through, throughout throughout the U.S. So in all the states that we operate in, which for the purpose of this call is California, of course, Colorado, Florida, Texas, uh, Washington, and now New York. So we're awesome. up to 40% of supporting local government. Awesome. So, so we're, we're seeing some phenomenal things 
We're seeing some phenomenal growth in the local government space, and we're excited to share that with you. And so let's move. On. And so uh, uh, as Marissa may have mentioned, we love the conversational approach to webinars. So we have folks manning the chat. So if you have questions during the presentation, please drop a note in the chat. Uh, and our moderator will presence that for us. We've also reserved some time at the end of the presentation that we could uh, take your questions and feedback and answers. Uh, so Brysha, you know, we've heard uh, since 2020, uh, DEI before 2020, DNI, uh, again, as uh, unapologetic word nerds that we are, when we say diversity, equity, and inclusion, what do we mean? What are we talking about? Well, Jack, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion has a very unique perspective across the U.S. right now. So let's talk about the way we see it at CPSHR, uh, rooted in cultural intelligence, we like to start by saying what DEI is not. So we know it is not shame and blame. We're not here to be like, well, X amount of years ago, this happened, that happened. It's your fault. No, it's your fault. We cannot move forward as a culture, as a nation of people and organizations if we continue to shame and blame. So we learn to remove that. Let's have more open space conversations. This also includes that we have to not lean towards our culture wars, even though it might be our current nature. Once again, we're trying to build that inclusion with one another. So we can't be a part of the culture wars of this happened versus that happened. And that also includes politics. I know people are like, wait a minute, how can we not get into politics? Because in DEI, we do not care how you vote through the lens of cultural intelligence. We do not care if you're red, if you're blue, if you're purple, if you're green. That is not what we're trying to do to connect the human experience. So political correctness also does not play a part in this. The reason why is because we wanna grow. We wanna learn cultures and we wanna be able to have conversations as humans. So as Bene Brown says, you know, we wanna get it wrong so we can get it right. DEI is hard, but we can do hard things. Right. That also includes the reboot of affirmative action. And this doesn't mean that if you're for affirmative action or you're against affirmative action, hey, that's great. We accept you either way, but that's not a part of what the root of what we're trying to get to in DEI. I, so, I really, I love how you say that. And I, I, I just, uh, again, while this is not shame and blame, we do recognize and, and, and the importance of acknowledging the lived experience of every single human. And we know that no two humans have the same lived experience. And so, but again, I love what you're saying. So this, it's not any of those things. And so that means, what is it? What is DEI? DEI is engagement. Engagement. Uh, Say more all, about that. And for all the folks who have met us, spent time with us, they you already know how much we live that DEI is engagement. It is about employee engagement and building connections. It's about understanding and collaborating with the organization to have better engagement and fostering a better environment for your employees. It's about promoting inclusion and equity in the organization. And my absolute favorite, it's about operationalizing cultural intelligence in an organization. We go further together. Uh, that absolutely. is what true DEI that's how we see DEI, and that's what we truly believe that across the nation, DEI should be about engagement. Right. I love that you how you present that. And, um, you know, there are levels to this conversation, and you and I have seen that. So in our local government, in our, our local government engagements in California, in Colorado, in Florida, now in the state of New York, and uh, in the state of Washington, we're seeing that there are levels of these conversations. So as you said, general DEI, general diversity, equity, and inclusion, really engagement work. And then there's a deeper level, right, in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, then there's A, B, acceptance and belonging. Those are more nuanced conversations and they take us deeper. And then there's that anti-stigma work. There's that anti-racism work. There's anti-Blackness work. So there are levels. And one thing that we're finding that's creating success is that we get to work with our local government partners 
to be intentional about which level of DEI are we starting this journey on? Is this engagement? Is this a deeper level of acceptance and belonging? Are we doing deeper dives into anti-stigma or anti-racism or anti-Blackness, but appreciating the levels and the structures uh, of, this, uh, of this space really seek to, well, once we've been able to identify and align with mm -hmm. our partners about this is the work, it makes the work that much easier. And it creates, uh, well, I'll just say this, we're all trained in crucial conversations and crucial conversations has the tenet that clarity is kind. So where we know where we're going, um, it's a greater likelihood that we're going to get there. Don't you Don't you think? And so, uh, Brescia, mm -hmm. uh, of our um, DEI engagements, if you were able to kind of ballpark it, what level is engagement? What level is more the anti-racism, anti-stigma work? Uh, again, as a project manager, what are, you, what are you seeing? What are the trends that you're seeing? I'm so glad you, you asked that question because what, what we've learned, especially myself through this, in, this entire process, when we say DEI is engagement, that is truly foundational. And so we definitely had clients, I and mean, we won't out our clients, but we've definitely had clients who are passionate and really want to move to an anti-racist justice lens. They really want to be in the in the Jedi space, so justice, equity, diversion, inclusion space. And, and we love that for them. But we've learned that if we don't start at engagement, because engagement is saying that all humans belong in this conversation, because we all need to move forward in this conversation to create a sense of healing, to create a sense of growth, but to have an open, an open view of how do we do this work. And, and that's kind of what I've learned is awesome. We love everyone for where they want to be, but we also help ground and support people for where they are. And if they have not done the engagement work, and Jock, I know you're going to take us through our DEI wheel. That's our modality of DEI at CPSHR. We kind of, on the wheel, we have to bring you back to the sense of engagement. This is where we need you to start. So all of your organization wants to do this work with you. Uh, or, and, and we can lift up the people who powerfully want to be involved in the work. But it can't be that, hey, we're Jedis today. And anybody that's not a Jedi with us, we leave them behind. That does not that does not build the best results in organizations when we move like that. I, I love what you said about meeting people where you are, because that really is our hallmark, right? Because this is not about judgment, not about shame and blame, like you said before, but it's about really not only meeting folks where they are, but also recognizing, and this is one of the key takeaways, so no spoiler alert, but kind of a spoiler alert, uh, the, the, the real awareness is that in the organizational development space, that this is ongoing, that this is a journey that is uh, multi-generational, that these are not flavor of the week or flavor of the month conversations when you have them through the lens of both cultural intelligence and employee engagement. These are conversations that we're going to be having for years and years and years to come. And so it's really important when we work with our local government clients that we really level set and manage those expectations because this is not a one and done. This is, and in fact, let's talk about that. So when we when we talk about understanding our why, uh, this is, uh, you know, why are we doing this work? And it, it's really helpful. I think it's helpful for us to recognize, hey, where did we start? Where was this? And so if we roll back to the 20th century, right? Historically, when we looked at DEI, uh, we looked in three areas, compliance, recruitment, and training. And many of our clients, wouldn't you say, in the local government space, when we begin the engagement, think, oh, well, DEI is one of these three things, wouldn't you say? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So then if, if we drill down in the area of compliance, are we being sued? Are we getting complaints? Are we getting grievances? How many complaints have we received? You know, again, these, uh, when you look at this perspective, this is defensive, this is reactive, this is where we were in the 20th century. And again, not about shame, not about right or wrong, but just about awareness, right? So as we move into recruitment, 
we need more fill in the blank candidates. Uh, you know, we, we were looking at this again, reactive. We need more green M&Ms. We need more blue M&Ms. Well, let's go get the green and blue M&Ms. And now look at us. Wow, aren't we diverse? Uh, and our philosophy in the 20th century, especially for those of us in the local government space, because we offered wonderful government benefits and longevity and tenure and all the things that we would, well, it reminds me of one of my favorite movies, Dances with Wolves, right? If you build it, they will come. So we would post and we're, we're the city, we're the county, we're the public utility, we're the, you know, fill up with the district. And folks are going to come just because we are who we are. And that may have worked in the 20th century, but in the 21st century, we've seen that as HR professionals, uh, not so much, right? Uh, and then in the area of training, again, very defensive, very pro, uh, uh, very uh, uh, defensive, reactive not responsive, not proactive. We were more concerned with checking the box than moving the needle. I'm reminded of, um, again, I've been doing this work for over 25 years. So remember when we started sexual harassment prevention training in the 90s, there was this thing, there was an incident that occurred and we would work with our risk managers and the risk management team and the legal team would say, make sure that everyone's trained. And so we focused on the training Everyone got their certificate, certificate went in the training file, but we never really looked at the work environments and we never really looked uh, analytically from an organizational development space and said, how is the environment contributing to these claims? How can we modify or change the environment so that we could see a reduction in claims? So again, very defensive, very reactive, uh, in the 21st century, we have shifted, and in the 21st century, we now have a more comprehensive, a more holistic, a more global approach. And so when we look at, you know, how can we create this lasting sustainable change through this initiative, it really is about what you were talking about earlier, cultural intelligence, don't you think? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, my dog's flipping out in the back. <laughs> but absolutely. Uh, there's a question in the chat that, that wants you to go back and talk more on the job descriptions and says, can you explain what do you mean by not updating job descriptions? So I think a little clarification. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for that question. So again, when we look from a holistic 21st century perspective, really looking at um how is the environment and every aspect of the work environment creating a welcoming and inclusive culture. It's really important that we focus on policy. Policy, uh, practices, procedures are the drivers of transformation, right? So if we want, you know, with respect to job descriptions, uh, are there DEI competencies? Are there DEI goals and objectives for our leadership team? Are we really intentional from the recruitment and the selection phase of seeking candidates who have uh, these values that we are espousing are now our organizational values? And we can go into this further as we look at um, our approach, which is what we call our DEI wheel. This is our tool, uh, and I, I will discuss the job descriptions more specifically in the context of the, uh, of the DEI wheel. So if we look at, and this is the way in the 21st century, how we approach these transformational conversations. This is not check the box. This is, this is a moving the needle. This is from an organizational development, from an organizational design, from an employee engagement approach, looking at the entire life cycle of employment and the entire life cycle of the organization. So as we look at the 12 o'clock position, the strategic imperative, uh, those conversations really deal with what is it that we're doing and why are we doing it? Why are we spending taxpayer dollars, general fund revenue on these initiatives? What does success look like? And oftentimes what we find and Bryce, I know you and I have seen this a lot. Uh, there will be local governments that will start a DEI initiative, but not uh, really embrace that Stephen Covey principle of begin with the end in mind and not articulate 
this is why we're doing what we're doing, not articulate the business justification or necessity of this strategy, not define success. So we know that there are uh, very well, uh, um, there are robust EEO, equal equivalent employment opportunity policies. But when you look at DEI policies, this is still a growth opportunity for folks all across the spectrum local government, education, state practice. Uh, and there's a nuanced distinction between EEO, which are regulatory policies versus DEI, which is more holistic, which is more transformational. So recognizing and understanding the nuanced distinction between the two and their points of intersectionality. So is there a strategic plan? Is there an operational plan around DEI? And if not, and what we're doing right now with so many of our partners, we are supporting leadership teams in having these conversations. It's important to have the conversations, and it's important that the outcome of those conversations and uh, those initiatives are well communicated throughout the organization. That brings us to the two o'clock position, what we call the analysis of equity indicators. This is all about gathering data that is going to manage and inform this process. So we gather quantitative data in the form of DEI assessments, where we, fo where we focus internally within the organization, and we've done these assessments, we've done these surveys externally with communities. We also gather qualitative data in the form of focus groups for uh, or you know when we're looking internal to the organization and we've also done focus groups in the community we call them community listening sessions but it's really about how are we gathering that data and the third and most critical element is doing a comprehensive policy analysis and review let's remember that policy is the driver it is the engine of government action that policy created separate but equal policy create government policy created redlining government policy created uh sundown towns government policy created all of these barriers to inclusion and so here's the wonderful opportunity that government policy gets to be the solution so how are we writing our policies our practices our procedures to create that a positive uh, work environment uh, impact, right? So we spend a lot of time working with our, uh, our partners in local government there. And then that moves to the three o'clock position of the DEI education. Now that we have articulated the strategic imperative, now that we have gathered data, so we know where we wanna, we've met the, uh, the client, we've met the organization where it is. Now we can have customizable learning and, and, and education strategies, both formal and informal, that increase the awareness, that increase, increase the understanding of, uh, uh, of DEI and of where our local government partners are. And uh, Bresha, I know we've done a lot in this space in terms of, uh, and I know you have uh, been particularly at the forefront of working with our local government uh, partners to create customizable education solutions that really meet their need. Can you speak to what you're seeing on that end uh, as, as you're working with many of our local government partners here, Colorado and other parts of the country? Uh, absolutely. Um, we have really launched a very unique approach to uh, DEI education training in a local government space and being able to get across uh, the different departments in the agency. So we built a cohort modality where we put uh, different levels of like-minded people and groups of cohorts. So that means combining libraries with public works or, or my favorite parks and recreation. So any of those shout out to all the parks and rec folks. Yes, I watch a lot of TV at, in my in my free time when I'm when I'm working. Parks and recs was my thing. So to be in local government space and to hang out with parks and recs people. I, I am a fan and I do geek out over it. So being able to create these cross-functional cohort, cohort teams from different departments, we've seen a lot of success in that. Because a lot of times, which I did not realize that even in the public sector, there's a lot of isolation in these departments where you don't get a chance to get out and see what your other civil service 
folks, all the hard work that they're doing, what does it look like to help support and serve the community? So one of our ways to create that engagement and create that inclusion in DEI is we built these cohorts and we mix and match those different departments at those strategic levels to be able to learn and grow in the educational space together. And we have seen tremendous success across the nation in working with local city and county governments to be able to do that for their staff. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and. and and I love how, um, so when we design the cohorts, we design them, we can do them cross-functionally. We also have done them uh, by classification. Again, one of, the, one of the hallmarks of this work is establishing a high level of psychological safety for all mm -hmm. of our participants. And so we don't want to put some oftentimes, and again, we check in with the local government partner, right? Because we don't want to put um, a, a line staff with a supervisor necessarily in, a, in one cohort uh, because we want, we want the staff members to be free to get feedback, to share their lived experience. Uh, as we move into deeper models and deeper conversations, yes, we uh, we lean into those cross-functional models, but recognizing that these conversations can be difficult for many people, we really lead with establishing that psychological safety, establishing that emotional safety, removing judgment from the education space, and we use the crucial conversations framework and modality when we're in the learning and education space. So we are not leading with advocacy. We are leading with awareness. We're leading with understanding. We're leading with connection. We're leading with what the work is engagement. And so we have formal and informal uh, training and, and, and learning opportunities. A formal setting would be you know, an actual cultural intelligence class uh, whether it's understanding implicit bias or whether it's managing conflict through the lens of equity or, uh, you know, understanding gender equity and gender expression, more informal setting may be a lunch and learn where we'll introduce one topic or, uh, you know, and just give folks an opportunity to engage around that topic. We have a comprehensive DEI reading list that we're a, a library that we're always updating, we're sharing with our local government partners and encouraging them to encourage their teams to continue the learning and education even outside of the formal setting. And so as we move down to the five o'clock and seven o'clock positions, this is the heavy lift. This is where the rubber meets the road because this is all about operationalizing the work. So. Mm -hmm. This is the key, and Russia, I find that this is a, a, a key differentiator, if you will, between the 20th century construct and the 21st century construct, because in the 20th century, you were done with training. Hey, we got our certificate. It's in the file. Everybody go back to work and do what they were doing, right? And, and But what we're finding, especially in the local government space, and you may want to speak to one, one or two e examples of operationalizing the work. This is where we actually work with human resources departments. We work with police departments. We work with your favorite parks and recs or libraries or cultural services or city clerk's office in terms of how do we get to, through the HR management lens, infuse equity and inclusion and access and belonging in every core aspect of the organization. So how does DEI show up in the recruitment process? How does DEI show up in performance management process? How does it show up in the vendor procurement program uh, process or program inclusivity? And this is where, uh, for our participant that asked the question about job descriptions, this is where we work with HR departments, primarily looking at leadership uh, job descriptions. So those managers, supervisors, senior level positions. And if DEI is going to be a part of the DNA of the organization, then again, clarity is kind. So what are the competencies that we are uh, inviting or that we are requiring our senior leadership team to have as it relates to DEI? What are those competencies for managers and supervisors? We know and what we're seeing, and Bryce, you can speak to this too, how we're providing support to mid-level managers. So I know a lot of questions in there. <laughs> let me just pause and let you get in, in terms of the operationalizing. Um, so, okay, all great questions. All great. Um, 
I'm just going to go down the list. So I will say kind of going back to what we talked about with engagement, it, there is there is level there's levels to the game, right? And from a from a space of engagement, when it comes to hiring processes, the first thing we do is look at job descriptions for this from a sense of inclusion. Is there an, is there enough equity and inclusion in this job description for you to cast the widest net to get the most qualified people who look who look who look like the universe, right? So not we're not looking for this group or this group. We're looking for the most qualified person ac across across the nation or whatever our area of scope is that that's engagement uh i think that that justice work that we talked about or the anti-racist work is digging kind of what you just spoke to that level deeper of what's the competencies for leadership in dei and that is something that with our partners that we are we are starting to see a trend in that direction where people are like hey i'm getting the hang of this engagement thing i'm getting the hang of how to be more inclusive now i want to go to that next level and really go back to our strategic imperative plans and go, where are we at from the leadership perspective? How are we walking to talk from the leadership perspective? And that's when you get into the competencies of leadership and saying, okay, I'm gonna hire based on these competencies. And now it includes DEI <coughs> and the cultural work. What are you doing in this space? What are you bringing to our organization to help us be more effective? And that is a real commitment from organizations when they do that, um, because you have to be bought in, not just as an organization, but uh, from the top, from the top down, you have to say if this person checks every box, they're great in all these areas. However, they have done nothing to help advance organizations forward from a cultural standpoint or a DEI standpoint. We don't feel that's the right person for us. We because we need this on our leadership team. And and there's and there's as we say, there's both and right. It's not wrong either way. If, if your organization is not doing that, they're bad. No, that's not that's not what we're saying. We're saying that this is what growth looks like. This is where you have to have grace for yourself, grace for the organization, and be able to move step by step in those areas. Absolutely. Did Absolutely. I miss anything? I no, got a lot of questions. That, that was and you 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 got it all. But the bottom line is, in terms of meeting our partners where they are, as practitioners, we model that we practice what we preach. This is not about, and that's the other thing it's important because folks, um, folks love comparative data and our assessment department has a wonderful repository of information where we can provide comparative data. And we know what Benjamin Franklin said, comparison is the thief of joy. And so where, where, where we're getting our local government partners to be that you become your own benchmark. Yes, you compare, you can, you have the ability to compare yourself with other similarly situated organizations. And in this work, um, you are a unique institution. And so you get to develop what are the metrics, what are the goals, what are the objectives, how, how do we define success as it looks for you, not for the organization or the agency down the street. So the awful lot of conversation there. And, and really what we find is that the success of our operationalizing is directly linked to the robustness of the strategic imperative conversations that we have at the outset. Uh, and so that's important. And also a little footnote. Uh, yeah, I quoted the wrong Kevin Costner movie. It is filled of dreams, not dances with wolves. So uh, uh, my, uh, I, 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 I'm 60 years young. And so occasionally I get it wrong. So uh, I'm embracing my humanity. And thank you for holding space for me, folks, for lovingly correcting me that it is filled of dreams. Uh, and, and so as we move, as we complete our conversation about so the I wheel. I just want to add one more thing. Yes, to this absolutely. Because I am a, well, I consider myself, I identify as a frontline warrior um, from the private sector to the public sector. It is, I carry a heavy torch for, for the folks who do the day-to-day -day work to reach the community. And what I really enjoy about our DEI, well, what I enjoy about our modality of DEI and CPS HR is that we have these conversations at the leadership level, but as we work through the wheel, as we go through all these steps, we always ensure what we call the roadmap is including the voices as all in the organization. And that includes your mid-level managers, your frontline workers, everyone. Everyone has to be in this conversation because you talked about comparison. What do you call it? Uh, comparison is a thief of joy. 
Yes. And and it, it truly is. So yes, we can bring that data to say, okay, this is how the city of X is doing it. This is how the, the county of Y is doing it. But the question is, how do you want to do it? How do you want DEI to be in your DNA? And that does not happen without your frontline workers, your mid-level managers, as well as your executive leadership team. So as we go through all this, we, we bring everybody on for their journey for the purpose of being successful. Because it can't just be leave it leave it in this corner and then let them work it out and the rest of us just have to do it right this is Absolutely. not a chore this is a movement Absolutely and let's say one more thing and yeah. this is something that makes our approach uh, somewhat novel and unique cuz when we say include all voices Folks, we mean all voices, especially and including the folks who haven't decided that they'd like to go on the DEI journey. This is really critical to establishing psychological safety for all your participants, regardless of where they are on the spectrum. And it is modeling that DEI is not about partisan or political conversations. DEI is you're not... Uh, for, this is not an initiative where you're leading with social justice advocacy. This is an uh, this is a, a an effort, an engagement strategy in which you're leading with. I want to be a high performing organization. High performing organizations, statistically, and the data is there wholeheartedly embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion. High-performing organizations give their teams, both leadership teams and staff teams, that sense of belonging. Uh, and so this is living into that aspirational vision. Will there be ramifications and implications in terms of you know, the social justice aspects or social justice outcomes? Perhaps, but that's not what we're leading with. We're leading with this is engagement work. And it's much easier to align teams around an engagement strategy than it is aligning folks around a social justice strategy. So that's one of the takeaways. And again, doing this work in Colorado, doing this work in Texas, doing this work in Florida, when we lead with engagement, there's an awful lot of energy and support in that space. Uh, and that's why we have taken the approach that we have. Uh, as we round up the wheel and talking about progress tracking and progress reporting, again, how are we communicating our growth or lack thereof with our stakeholders, both internal and external? And this is a transparent process. We designed this as a circle because it's a cycle. It's not a linear, uh, it's not a linear step one, step two, step three. And so, Bryce, we've we've encountered several partners who uh, have uh, you know, maybe have started at DEI learning and education, and they're like, oh, uh, you know, we've started doing training, but we never articulated what is the strategic imperative. So, yes, while we recommend that folks start at step one. We have worked with partners who have stopped, who have started with, uh, you know, all steps of this, uh, of this wheel, of this cycle. And again, because it, it should function the same way as the organization's institutional effectiveness model or continuous quality assurance model. And as we talk of, in the same way that local governments talk about fiscal accountability, in the same way that local governments talk about safety, um, you know, internal safety, cyber safety, what we are finding, what is a recipe for success is when uh, local governments are incorporating DEI as a part of that organizational conversation that now is embedded in their DNA. So I know we've shared a lot. Are there any questions yeah. specifically about uh, about the wheel? Um, so we have we have two. Okay, so awesome. Um, so one question is, what has CPS HR done to work with departments on updating the language and classifications? So we've done a lot. We've got a classification and compensation department, uh, and we work in tandem with that department to provide equity tools to um, update uh, classifications, to update, and language is important. Um, I love what Benet Brown says, uh, the limits of our language form the limits of our world. We know that language has the power to expand our awareness. Of, in fact, I think we have a slide somewhere that says that. 
yeah, here we go. Uh, the limits of our language form the limits of our world. And so we recognize that language is a powerful tool. And so working with our class and comp department, working with our recruitment solutions uh, department, we in DEI um, support both of those organizations, uh, uh, both of those units, business units, I should say, and really working with our partners on looking at the language. And again, not about judgment. These aren't right or wrong conversations. But the question that we ask our partners, is there a more effective way of messaging uh, 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 what we're trying to achieve here? And again, the goal from human resources is what are the knowledge, skill, abilities, and other attributes? that uh, support this position, right? And so in that space, there's lots of ways that we, we, we lean into language and we use language uh, to, uh, to, uh, to really support that as well. And the second question was, how will you engage the employees or managers? Again, uh, as uh, Raisha and I are both director level human resources professionals, uh, and so it really is about training, learning, and education, and then implementation. Uh, so we work, uh, and we're we're embedded in a number of HR departments with many of our our local government partners doing this work, modeling what it looks like uh, in terms of working with employee groups, working with um, affinity groups and ERGs to support the learning and education process and on the implementation. I, I think that's been really clear. Yeah. Uh, and, and that work is, uh, that work continues to be ongoing because again, just like you have a continuous quality assurance cycle for your organizations, you're always gonna be updating it because language changes. That's the thing, language has always changed. Language is going to continue to change. And so it's also level setting and managing those expectations of, of folks, whether it's administrative services, human resources, uh, city clerk's office, county executive administrator's office to know since language changes and just like, uh, well, California League of Cities since policy updates, we uh, likewise work with our partners to regularly assess, review policies, language, because those language, uh, that that language uh, changes as well. Yeah, Jack, I want to go a little bit more into the educational space because you touched on something and you are absolutely correct. When it comes to policies, we say hold grace, language changes, and you should always be looking at that for the update for that inclusion perspective. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to language to the conversation, so in the, we have a cultural intelligence series for, for those who may not know that here at CPSHR, we walk through uh, different, sections of DEI and one of and one of our sessions is on building the living glossary of language for DEI and we really use that to build a conversational box between management and frontline employees we don't when we say oh well whether I'm talking to parks and recs whether we're talking to public service whether we're talking to law enforcement we don't change the language Right, the experience we're having and how we relate to the different departments and what they're going through so they can better embrace and understand where they want to stand in DEI, we do that. But the language of how we choose to go in and educate a, an organization, it always stays the same. And the reason why is we want to leave organizations with something that they can ground themselves in with one another. So it doesn't matter what your lived experience is or what department you're in, you both can have a general understanding of what is DEI and what is the tools for me to be able to have the conversation around it. And I believe that that is truly one way that we're successful when we are engaging with cities and counties and those, the different government agencies, because we get we leave them with the, hey, here, here's your platform for language and tell them language grows. This is not, this is not a PC test. It's not a vocabulary test. Language grows, but here's the platform now. Here's where you get to start to help you grow and move forward with it. Absolutely. I think so key takeaways, language matters. Key takeaways, this is not check the box work. Key takeaways, this is longitudinal work. And so DEI gets to be infused in every core aspect of an organization. Uh, now, HR, 
plays a large role in this. And uh, there are other departments, there are other areas that are equally impactful in the DEI space. When we're talking about creating that uh, organizational change, of course, human resources is a driver, but the most important driver is the chief executive. And uh, and the the, re the research that we have done, which aligns to the research um, that is all across the nation, that says that these conversations that the thought leader for DEI needs to have access to the chief executive, uh, but not be embedded solely and exclusively in human resources or in compliance or risk management or in legal services, but should really have the same access that same C-suite access that uh, all the other departments had, and the all, all the other department heads have. So um, again, that's that's a powerful takeaway that we're that we are seeing, uh, and it's playing out um, really, really well for us. Now, there are questions about uh, will this will the slides be available? We're going to make the whole uh, recording available to you, and on the of the glossary. There was a question regarding Glassboard. We do a whole training on um, the language of DEI, and we have the updated. Uh, we we are constantly updating our reading list. Um, there is another update that is coming up in the next month uh, that we will publish. So if you reach out to us, we will give you what we have, and we will send you the updates. And again, it's important. Another key takeaway: this is mindset work. This is mindset work that becomes heart set work that becomes committed action. So when we are in the learning and education phase, we are leading with mindset. We are not leading with social justice. We are not leading with critical race theory. We are not leading with any of these other modalities. Now, the, the, there are many modalities that are um, academically sound. And because we are exclusively in the government space and we work in the government space all across the country, when we were searching for a modality, we wanted a modality in which folks would align, that folks would come together, that folks would disarm. Because we recognized uh, that as we went in traditional DEI spaces, Folks came armored up. They were afraid. There was a lot of fear. There was no psychological safety. And so our design team put at the hallmark, at the crux, at the center, that need to develop psychological safety so that folks could truly be themselves, so that we could engage in the crucial conversations that were necessary, so that the needle could move, not so that we're checking a box. And the other key element that we're finding in terms of a recipe for success, we love to be embedded as part of the as part of the support team. We're working with the city manager. We're working with county execs. We are locked in lockstep with the HR directors because there are times that leadership is just gonna to need to have conversations. There are times that you're just gonna to need to have some coaching around an issue. So as we approach an issue in HR, we're used to doing, we're used to responding from a compliance response. Now we are expanding that platform, we're expanding that spectrum, and now saying, can we respond from a coaching response? Can we respond from a learning and education response as opposed to um, how we respond in you know, the classic sexual harassment prevention? That's clear compliance. We're going to respond with a compliance response. So these are the little, they, they, are, they may seem small, yet they are powerful. These small calibrations and shifts, when they are properly implemented, uh, within our local government partners, they are seeing uh, just dramatic gain, uh, like dramatic change and just like gangbusters. And, and folks are now, uh, there's a fluidity. There's a fluidity that we're finding in terms of conversations, in terms of engagement. And that's what, that is, a, that is an intended outcome. That's what we want to happen. Bryce, you said it earlier. Yeah. When we, yes. I, I'm, I'm loving the chat. And when you're done with your thought, someone has asked our favorite question. So I want to get that answer. Let's, we let's go now. Let's go now. So we have a lot of favorite questions. I will not make you guess because we've done this a lot with one another. But this is one of our favorite questions. Uh, and it's 
how can we engage in DEI and still hire qualified people? I oh, love that question. One of our favorite questions. And John, here's, here's an ad. Here's an ad because I have not okay. heard this one yet, but I like this. Um, also, DEI is being noted for bank closures. I have not heard that one yet. So thank uh, you for the new one, folks. That's a good one. Well, let's answer our favorite question. Right. How can we be engaged in DEI and still hire qualified people? Very easily. As HR professionals, we're always going to tell you, hire the best candidate. Diversity, our meaning of diversity is the sum total of all humanity. So diversity is not an othering of conversation. Diversity represents the sum total of all humanity. It is not just EEO. It is not just protected status or protective classifications, but it is the full spectrum of all humanity. So diversity, so concepts of neurodiversity, communication diversity, socioeconomic diversity, diversity of thought, it's that entire spectrum. And so where we coach our local government partners as well as well as all our partners, that let's let's just fish in a wider area. Let's just look, let's look at our policies and see, and this, this is not about lowering standards, it is updating, it is broadening those standards so that we can have a greater pool of highly qualified candidates from representing all of the diversity dimensions. Uh, so um, this is never an example of, oh, I'm going to hire this person because they're blank. We're going to tell you, hire the best candidate. We're also going to show you how you can find those uh, diverse stars because uh, that it, it, that's not the post and pray philosophy. Well, we posted it on the job site and we looked at LinkedIn and you know, no, this is this is active recruitment and that's where the human resources management field, had, especially in the talent acquisition space, that's a major shift. We're seeing that in the private sector, we're seeing it in the government sector, we're seeing it in the nonprofit sector. We now get to be active recruiters and go to where the stars are. So, um, uh, and, and, and we've got lot, we've got an entire recruitment solutions team back uh, you know, at the shop, we've got an entire classification and compensation team, uh, and we support both of those teams that are executive search team, same, same thing. We now know that we get to be actively recruiting uh, and we can do it in a way and we have seen results, uh, you know, for our clients as we have broadened standards, uh, as we have globalized standards, that we have seen a greater influx of highly qualified candidates. Yeah. And then just to add from the DEI slash HR perspective, um, one of the things to do to reduce bias is to go through and have HR scrub applications and resumes prior to going to hire managers. Also removing names, locations, having them focus on does this person meet the, the MQs, the minimum qualifications for the job. Um, we do that at CPS HR and Jock and I, we, even though we do this for a living, even we were like, oh, where's the name at? And where's the, you know, where school did they go to? Not they have a, a, a master's in, in business. Like, you know, we were like, well, well, where did they go? And we've learned and like, you know, you have to move away from that. Is this person qualified for the role? That's one step. The second step is having uh, diverse panels. And we said diversity is a total sum of all humans. So not just diversity in ethnicity, but diversity in gender, diversity in neurodivergencies, just diverse diversity in just departments. Like create as much diversity on your hiring panels as possible based on what you currently have. You can't be like, well, we're not diverse because we don't have enough X people. No, your organization has some form of diversity and the more thought, the more difference of thought you bring into the space, the better the results uh, will be moving forward. And of course, what Jock's saying, being intentional and not just uh, post and pray, but actually being intentional and casting the net and going out and looking for different diverse candidates to be able to even join in the interview. And I, I know we had some conversations about Jedi in the chat, that justice equity, that level deeper, when we go to that level deeper of engagement, is now that we have, now we've done the work to go out and get this smorgasbord of diverse candidates, you have to look at the organization from an inclusion and equity standpoint. Because if you have, if you bring on, if you bring on folks who have not typically been in the organization, there's, there's not a lot of space 
in place for them in the organization. So you have to be intentional in creating that. That's when we start going back, looking at policies. Is the policies equitable, right? Are they fit for all the humans in your organization or have they been uh, typically geared to one type of human in your organization? Those hey, are the levels hey, deeper we go through. Yes. Uh, there is a question in the chat that I'd like to uh, that I'd like us both to address. Uh, I know you and, guys and gonna was, light up the chat the last right, few minutes. We'll right, it says. It. So, can't you also touch on strategies used to uncover and address negative perceptions and misinformation about DEI being dismissed as a cultural social justice program with little merit? Absolutely. That all that is for us when we do this work, we do we hit that head on. So in our strategic imperative conversations about talking about what this work is not versus what this work is, that's where we initially address it. We also address it in the learning and education because uh, it, it's really important, even in terms of hiring committees and hiring managers and supervisors, the prevailing best practice is that there gets to be robust training around that. So we know that all humans have bias, right? And so what is the level of implicit bias training that we're doing to uncover those blind spots? All humans have blind spots. What are we doing to presence those blind spots, to recognize them and to neutralize them? It's one thing to say, oh yeah, I know I'm biased. But what are we doing to neutralize it? What are we doing to disrupt it? What formal strategies and informal strategies? And that's a way that we've been powerfully supporting our partners. There's some free, you know, open source materials such as the Harvard Implicit Association Test. That if you have not taken that, I would recommend everyone to. I've taken that about four or five times. I am always uncovering a bias that I didn't know I have. But once I once it's in my awareness, now it is my professional responsibility to move through that to disrupt that bias. So it's it's recognizing uh, the learning and education, the training and development capacity of the organization should include all of this, uh, because if we if we hire and, and we say, oh well, that's the way we've always done it, then that represents a growth opportunity for your organizations. Because the question gets to be, is there a more effective way that we can go through these hiring processes, these onboarding processes that make us uh, live into our aspirational vision of becoming a high performing organization? Lot of great, lot yeah, of great, great questions. Yeah. Uh, I point. believe we'll be able to hold on to this chat after this. So if we don't catch her, everybody will we'll start sending out links. So we'll the, send links so to the, the name of the Harvard, Har yeah, the name of the Harvard test is Harvard IAT, Implicit Association Test. So if you Google it, Harvard IAT, um, you will uh, you will find uh, you will find that. So Teresa had a question recently while walking out of a Jedi related meeting, a young white conservative man asked what's what space for him where he would not offend. How does the strategy address the feeling of displacement? Again, this is an engagement strategy for everyone. Diversity is the sum total of all humanity, inclusive of white people, inclusive of white men, inclusive of white men over 40, under 40. And I'll tell you why. If this is supposed to be an engagement strategy, and it is, how can you have an effective engagement strategy if folks don't see themselves powerfully represented within the framework? And so for us, it's absolutely critical that every human being in your organization sees themselves within this framework, this framework being the DEI framework. This is not a conversation for black and brown people and for people of certain genders and gender expressions and orientations. This is not an othering conversation. For those of us who have that mindset, the growth opportunity is recognizing uh, the, the spectrum of diversity, equity, and inclusion includes all humans. Uh, someone says, what plans has CPS Consulting done to engage the community on what expectations to see in the candidate for city manager? So our it, we've worked really closely with our exec search team in giving them equity competencies for all CEO positions, uh, not just the city manager position. And if you 
contact us after the webinar. We'd be happy to connect you with those folks and those resources. Um, hey, Jacques what, and Brescia, really quick. Yes. Um, while we're coming up to the end of our presentation, we're more than happy to have you go over time if you guys want to stay and continue answering questions. That's perfectly fine. But before we go, I just want um, to mention that the recording will be posted later this afternoon on our webinar page. I'm going to post the link in the chat. And again, it won't be posted till later this afternoon. I have to upload the video and that does take time. So I'm just going to post that. And I just want to say thank you, Jacques and Brescia, for being here today for this excellent, engaging presentation. I'm sure everyone has enjoyed it, um, as we can see by the chat here. Lots of questions, very informative. Um, so again, thank you, Jacques. I'm going to hand over the presentation to you, so feel free to end it at your convenience, okay? Okay, all right. And, and thank you, Marissa. And thank you, everyone. We love, Brescia and I love, love, love having this level of engagement. You've got lots of questions. Brescia, could you drop our uh, contact information in the chat? Because we want to go back and have an opportunity to answer all of your questions because they are so valuable. Um, and, and again, let's remember, this is mindset work. Um, and even in the formation of the questions, it gives us some feedback of where our mindsets are. So um, the, one of our favorite questions is about how can you do DEI and hire outstanding candidates? We say very easily because that, and and that, and we've heard the, and again, not about judgment, but we've heard the question expressed lots of different ways all across the country, not just in California, but in Florida and Texas and Colorado, because there is a perception and we will say a misperception based on folks' experience of affirmative action, and again, a misperception that by hiring a diverse candidate, we are lowering the standards. That is a misperception, and certainly today in the space of cultural intelligence, there is no human resources professional that will ever tell you not to hire the best candidate. We're always going to say hire the best candidate. What we're going to do is support you on uh, increasing the richness of your uh, pools so that you have highly qualified uh, diverse candidates. What Brysha alluded to earlier was all about the equity analysis that we provide uh, in terms of the blind resume review that really allows more highly qualified candidates to come into the space. And so that it, it's really about, uh, not only is this mindset work, but it's mindset work that begins with us. And, and so uh, I, we get to do the work and, uh, and there are always higher and higher and deeper and deeper levels of elevation. That's why the work is never done. That's why you can't have a check the box approach and say, oh, well, we had our annual training, so we're all good, everybody back to normal. If we are not, if we are not focused on that continual quality improvement uh, where, where, we are in, where we are intentional about enhan enhancing the work experience, the employee experience, um, the citizen experience, the community member experience, the customer experience. If we are not focused on that, then um, then th that represents a growth opportunity for us, right, Raisha? Absolutely. Anything and you want to say? And uh, yeah. No, uh, I want to give. So I know we're down to our final thoughts, and we just greatly appreciate the last few who hung in here with us. Is there anybody? Well, we can take one more question. We, we, we are running over for the next meeting, but we will take one more question if anyone has anything else. If not, I did put uh, contact information in the chat and we always welcome to, to reach out to us and send us emails and any information we can share, we are always happy to do so. It truly is our pleasure to serve public sector employees as well as civil servants. Absolutely. And Erica, thank you for that comment because that's, abs that's part of the work that we do, Erica, in terms of uh, and again, all humans have varying degrees of uh, misperceptions and misinformation based on their lived experience, based on the socialization process. We uncover that when we talk about, um, you know, uncovering bias, implicit bias through the lens of cultural intelligence. So again, that's another reason why these conversations 
are not advocacy driven. These conversations are really engagement driven. We're meeting folks where they are. We're creating a high degree of psychological safety so that we get to utilize our emotional intelligence tools of self-awareness and self-reflection and social and situational awareness so that we can see where our growth opportunities are as individuals. And let me tell you something, all 8 billion people on the planet have those growth opportunities. And so if we're coming into the space saying, oh, I'm gone, I'm good, I'm good, um, then that represents a growth opportunity. Because uh, it's not about being a good person. Am I an effective person? Am I an effective person at creating connection, at creating belonging, at creating safety for others? If I am, I'm well on my way. If I'm not yet, then there is a growth opportunity for me. And with that, I'm going to yield it back to you, Bryce, to close us out. All right. Uh, I could not have said it better myself. Um, I thank you all. Hopefully you will enjoyed us enough to come on, check out CPS HR. We have several, what we call cultural intelligence trainings where we've spoken about the living glossary. That's a training you can take. Implicit bias is a training. Managing conflict, crucial conversations. We love the work we do and we are here. So come visit us, reach out to us and we want to engage more with you. Thank you all. Absolutely. We appreciate all of you. We appreciate the work that you do in the local government space. As government employees, we get it and we get it. So, <laughs> so thank you folks. Have a great Wednesday. Have a great rest of your week and we hope to see you soon. And be sure to fill out the evaluation. Thank yes, you so please. much. Thank you.